The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Today I want to talk about this issue which we touch on from time to time but never get to the point of what we can do. And it is an issue re related to the environment, the climate, and Buddhism, where Buddhism offers something to this discussion. It is in the news a lot. It is on the minds of people worldwide. And yet, those who... Ah, have you got a, a seat? Good. Those who should be more responsible countries who are doing something but not enough and still we carry on in our lives as if nothing is happening. So I had a look at, um, you know, what has been discussed by the Buddha and by various groups, Buddhist groups in the world. And, and I'll just express this in this moment. I actually went to a two-day workshop with a well-known um, social environmental activist and a, a very prolific writer on the subject, uh, David Loy, wonderful writer. And David came to Melbourne recently and um, and did two workshops and offered a talk. And he has uh, written a book recently called Echo Dhamma. So, you know, where the environment and our Dhamma meet. And I, um, I was quite touched by the workshops. I felt they could have been more expressed on how to, but that seems to be developing with an interest group. And because I live in a, a, as you know, I live in a forest that every year faces bushfires, and I went through a bushfire and have spoken a lot on that, so that's not the topic today. But every time I go out and I look at my forest or I go and sit by the waterfall, we have a little waterfall, and the nature is very wonderful. When I go and sit there, I reflect on this environment is not only the home of millions, perhaps billions of life in this region, in this area, in this property, but it represents something that is so important for our life to exist. And I, I my main campaign, or one of my main campaigns during the bushfires, was to save the slathering, the useless culling of trees, of which have all come back, but to make a point of how important it is for us and our children to experience these environments, to experience nature. We don't do enough of it. Often, even when we go on a retreat, we sit in a room for 10 days and maybe take a little walk in the garden. But we do not do enough of actually experiencing ourselves as one in connection with nature. And this is what the Buddha did every single day of his life. Now, is there enough chairs back there? Sorry. Good. <laughs> Full house today. I'll start with a little story which is quite interesting in the Buddhist idea of how evolution began. And the Buddha talks about, um, if I can find it here, but it doesn't matter, I know the story. The Buddha talks about the... Uh, 
the nature is not just in the sense of the nature of man, but the nature is everything. And if we consider everything as in the nature of mind, the mind, nature of mind holds everything. And he's, he tells this story of how, because his perspective is very much about, you know, how the human, and all beings really, but how the human can develop to be free of its, our suffering, our, our, our pain. So he always refers from this perspective of the first two noble truths, the suffering, the pain, and its causes. This is the perspective the Buddha came to his understanding through. So based on that, we have this story. And the story is about, the Buddha talked about uh, pre-human existence. There were very refined spiritual beings in the world. And these very refined spiritual beings were gravitated towards this world because of these fragrant and subtle smells that were very sweet and very delightful. And they would take in these smells as a nourishment. It was their food. I mean, we know from Mahayana texts, they talk about the 33rd realm. They just, their food is like a fragrance, very high refined fragrance. They don't need any more. But when the Buddha is talking about this, he's talking about not such high beings, but, you know, lower spiritual beings, devas and so forth. And they're attracted to this earth because of this buttery, maybe a ghee-like smell. It is where, you know, the pre-vegetation or the pre-life had some sort of mold on this, this world. And they, they became so attached to it that their very subtle bodies began to become very, a little more gross, a little bit more substantial as the food they were taking in. And then as the time went on and they were getting greedier and greedier for these fragrances that then they wanted to have food, that they found the fragrances were also connected to various fungus and mushrooms. So they started to eat these fungus and mushrooms. I mean, we're talking about a mythical story here, you know, we don't know for sure, but it has some, some interesting truth to it. And so then as they partake of these funguses and then various grasses that started to grow, edible weeds and grasses, they developed these these forms. It took a long time. We're talking about eons, as we say in Buddhism. Now, is there one more chair left? I think one in a corner over here. And, uh, and then when they started to take more of these grasses and greens, they got very greedy about having enough. And what happened was their bodies that were a very non-sexual body became this male-female form. And with this came the reproduction of humanity. What happened is they became greedier and they produced families. They fought. Now, they had never really been very, uh, in any way, aggressive. And even probably apart from having joy, they were joyous spiritual beings, very happy spiritual beings. They, they didn't have greed or heavily de heavy desires, so they lived in a very purified, heavenly, happy, joyful place. But as they became more human and more greedy, and more about me, then there became this argument about who owned what. And with the arguments, then they created leaders who, people who had more intelligence than others that would then try and 
bring order to these little societies. I mean, this, in this mythology, we, we can hear these interesting facets about what's going on with us now. You know, we are beings who have become incredibly embodied, you might say, in the world we live in, and very reliant on the food and the grasses, and now the animals that eat the grasses and the, the animals that eat the animals. But we have also developed these social systems and these political systems and these hierarchical systems that guide us in how to live and how to develop a social human behavior that either gets along with one another or it doesn't. And we know the ramifications of what happens and what has happened as human society has developed itself. But some of the things that we have not developed along with this is the um, the capacity to live in harmony with not only one another, but the environment we live in. So as those humans developed more greed, then they developed ways and means to cultivate enough, for a long time enough. But at some point, in very recent history, and we must remember in the time of the Buddha, there was possibly very little concern of climate change. There was very little destruction. There would be some, but very little destruction of the forests. But we read in the suttas there was a lot more planting of forests, especially in the Buddhist, um, the boats where the Buddha practiced and stayed. But there would have been natural disasters and there would have been great death. And we know pre the Buddha there was extinction of existence and many animals and many forms of life through to the natural causes. But the human cause has never been greater than in this last 100, 200 years. The devastation has never been so great. And so, because of this, I wanted to bring around the, the inquiry that's really important for us. Um, I mean, the Buddha goes into a lot more around the moral implications. You know, there's the, the stories that um, in one of the, the suttas that the average human lifespan is going to continually reduce because of the greed and the... Um, this lack of ability for humans to coexist and respect one another and the heavy moral implica implications that come from um, excessive abuse of the precepts. And he talks about that um, in this sutra that lifespan will gradually reduce to 10 years and, and a child of five will be marriageable. I mean, this is a very, uh, um, what can we say, it seems very removed from our understanding, but we do know that at times lifespan has greatly reduced. At the moment we're on a high of lifespan, so it's very hard for us to imagine, but a hundred years ago lifespan was, you know, the average age was 30, 40. 500 years ago, at times it was even um, less. Because depending on the periods at that time, 
of what was happening regarding wars or what was happening regarding famines and illnesses that, that struck different parts of the world, very great mass numbers of people died prematurely. You know, we know from the Black Death in Europe, over um, a third of the people died. And other places, over half of people that died. So the Buddha, Buddha also talks about um, when, you know, humans are so lustful and so greedy that the rains will stop. You know, he, he talked about, when he came to these understandings, he talked about the four elements. The four elements, or the five elements really, including space, within our body and in nature. And as these elements um, allow life, forms of cells from the moisture to the heat to create life and to, for life to coexist, in a very natural order, in a natural way. You know, these, uh, these elements need to be sustained. You know, there needs to be enough rain, there needs to be enough heat, there needs to be enough earth for life to grow. But when it, one is extreme, <coughs> as we, we've seen through the disasters we have, one, one or another is extreme, then certain life forms start to diminish. And at the moment, you know, I'm part of a number of environmental clubs which I've just donated to <laughs> over the years um, without thinking that much of it. But we're just noticing a lot of our species are being removed because of simple harvesting. You know, just in Talangi, near my neighbour, you know, there is certain little um, um, gliding the little gliders, the little fly, uh, flying possums, <laughs> the little gliders are, are dying out. There's a few that have died out. There's a lot of bird species that have died out in recent times. And now we're finding every year, I forget the number, but it's quite a large number in Australia of species that are, are leaving this planet because of our actions. And the Buddha talked about in the uh, Nansha Niyadamaya, he, he talks about this, he talks about five laws, but actually when I had a look, it seems to be seven laws. And these seven laws need to work in, in an interdependent way. He talks about the season law, such as the, the seasons need to be there. When we start to reduce down to one season, we have problems. He talks about the seed laws. So the seeds need to have soil that they can actually grow in. If soil becomes too acidic, a lot of the seeds will not grow. If they become, you know, in another way, other seeds won't grow. Then we have these other physical laws. The physical laws is in relation to our physical body that needs the physical uh, um, land that we walk on to be habitable. If, it, if the physical laws start to uh, change, then we see a whole movement of the planet. It just shifts very slightly, and that very slight shift will cause massive extinction. And then we have these uh, moral, uh, the psychological laws. It's, this is getting more on the, the political, how our minds can shape our world, how our thoughts shape our world, how shape our every day, what we put in our mouth, what we choose, what we choose to um, have a lot of or not. So we start to think in certain psychological patterns that create other patterns in our body that create patterns in the world around us. And the more you meditate, the more you start to see how these patterns are working, how your thoughts and behaviours are creating these systems or destroying them. I mean, the Buddha's practice of meditation is very much primarily 
to start to look into these behaviours that are affecting not only ourselves but the world we live in. And these psychological laws play out in our societies where groups of people start to think and behave. And then we have moral laws which we, we understand from the Buddhist teachings. There is the moral law of how I keep and live by the, the Dhamma, by the precept. But there is the moral law that is a greater moral law, that I actually have some responsibility in the bigger picture. I have some interest, investment in it. And we forget this. You know how many of us go on every day thinking tomorrow will be exactly the same? Most of us. We continue to consume in similar ways. Our greedy habits continue. We're always looking for something a little bit better. And we're also collecting in groups of people who think exactly the same of us. And that becomes a force in itself. Interesting to sit in this little, this group of people who had come for these workshops. You know, some came back for the second day. Most people wouldn't, don't even give enough time to go to it. You know, they might go to the talk because they can only have two hours in that week to do that. Because the rest of the things in the week are so much more important. You know, the dinner parties and the, the gym and the, <laughs> the football and the, Whatever, there's so many other things that, that have impatinated in our psychology that drive us in certain ways to think. But, you know, what is impatinated today? <laughs> we have a very full house and people listening to a topic you probably don't want to listen to, but anyway. <laughs> and then we have the causal laws. And the causal laws are the reasons behind these natural laws. You know, the, uh, the, the first four, you might say, the seasonal, the seeds, the physical laws, and the biological laws, um, these work within their own spheres. You know, you know we know what happens to for matter to break down in a forest. You start to see these, these fungi at work, the very, very fine strands of a delicate network of little workers in the forest that break it down to become, you know, other material for food for, for, the, for the trees and for the insects and animals. But then when we start to look at the moral, the causal laws, the psychological laws, you know, these all are not only connected to the, the physical laws, but they're also working, interacting with each other all the time. The mind is, is a very, very interesting tool. I remember when I was sitting in these meetings, post in the, 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 the renewal of King Lake, the rebirth of post bushfires where they're all deciding what to have and what they want and, and the fights that go over the swimming pool versus the arts and cultural centre. They get, got neither because the fights were so many. But very few were that interested in, well, maybe we should do some things in, in the, around the forest to stop, you know, to both protect the forest keep it sustainable, keep it growing, and at the same time, you know, more preventing of, of disaster and bushfire. But nobody really talked so much about that. We had workshops with the highest professional people from around the world who came to talk about sustainable housing, sustainable water. We have, live on aquifers and it's all being sold to Coca-Cola at the moment. 
and, and coming down to the swimming pools in Turak. Trucks and truckloads every day and they're still harvesting the trees every day from Telangi because people have become very quiet. But we had very small audience at these very professional level. You know, people, the bushfire specialists telling us where the next bushfire will be because they can tell over the hundred years by the undergrowth of the trees. So these very interesting things is where the psychological, the society that thinks about these problems, we who think about these problems get overwhelmed and we don't know how to do anything. And so this is where I'm coming to what I want to really talk about today. So if you give me a moment to just click it on to the other one. Um, I've got to see how to do this. There it is. Um, I, w I want to talk more today about things we can actually start to do. Now we are doing meditation. Many of you here, if you've never done a retreat, would you like to just show me with your hand? So just a few of you, but that's fantastic. Thank you for coming. And I do hope we can see you at some retreat or another soon. But most of you have done a retreat. So most of you are starting to work on your moral and your psychological understanding of who you are. How many of you eat very consciously and carefully? So, not, not enough. Not enough. That's probably about a sixth of the room, maybe less. So that means that we're eating out of a need or a desire, or a social connection. We eat when we eat socially with the family, with our friends, and we, we eat what we can, when we can. So you can see here that we start to work on some aspects of ourselves. How many of you actually are engaged in some form of social, environmental, work, political, even less. So there we, we, we have some guideline. We are studying the Dhamma. We are doing some meditation. We have come today, you know, to take out a Sunday morning to come here is very, very, very wonderful. It takes a lot to get up and come. But there are, to balance the life in the way the Buddha balanced his life. And he would have eaten very carefully, even though he ate what he was offered. He lived and worked and would have spoken a lot more about nature than I've shared here. I've got quite a lot more I can share he would have exercised. That's something. How many of you are exercising daily, weekly? That's the best outcome. <laughs> Thank you. So we're doing something right. <laughs> because we all know if we don't exercise, we may not make it <laughs> to an older age. Then we have the Dhamma. You know, so you're studying Dharma, you're here, you're wanting to learn. You're wanting to see how to live a fuller, happier, healthier life. That's why we study Dhamma. We want to find out how to become liberated. But without a happier, healthier mind, it is very difficult. We need to have some equanimity, we need to have some balance of mind. If it's always suffering, it's very difficult. If it's too high and we're too rich and we're too happy and we're too delighting in all the, the luxuries of life, then it is very difficult to understand the Dhamma. But the one thing that I feel is missing 
is our engagement with nature, with the natural world. We live in, mostly live in suburbs, in cities, in big houses, or maybe not such big houses, but we live in a certain amount of middle-class comforts and that occupies a lot of our time and our thinking. And I'm wanting us to have a look at this, listen to this. Um, a group of people, Buddhist, I suspect quite a number of maybe Zen Buddhists, I don't know because it's often in the Zen tradition, they, they take up this cause. But it was through discussions um, on climate change and climate disruption and environmental concerns that a core Dharma group came together and developed this 16 core Dharma principles that are important to address climate change and how Dharma practitioners can engage. So some of these you will notice you are doing already. Firstly, we need to have a reverence for life, a respect for life. Without a respect for life, in particular our own life, we still have issues with a large number of youth, young people, suiciding. They have not yet developed that part of the brain that respects and values their life. But we first must have reverence for life. From this point forward, climate disruption is overriding the context for all life on Earth, including humans. What we humans do will determine what life survives and thrives, and in what forms and in what locations and where. So reverence of life is all life. The first of the precept is not to bring harm to life, but to nourish and respect and nurture life. When we consider how do we do that, you know, it is, if you sat for a week and contemplated, how can I deeply respect not only this life, and all the cells and all the bugs within it, <laughs> but the life that surrounds me. Other human forms, animal forms, insect forms, those born in the air, those born in water. How do I respect? We often have a struggle with this because we come up with these quandaries, what to do when we have rat infestation, what to do when we have mosquito infestation. These are very big questions to ask ourselves. And I must point out, even though there is a, a, a point to try and preserve, there is also a point where illness can happen and we have to protect our bodies or our family. But these questions are something that beyond right and wrong, we have to at least have the mind that knows how to inquire into them. That is the important. The Buddha kept his mind very open and allowed his mind to inquire into it. He couldn't stop his family members killing each other over water. And there were times that he, as much as he said, don't take life, it still happened. But we have to know ourselves through our own action, what it is we can do that can bring more protection, more care, more love, and more reverence to life. Because that is what is going to keep human existence and other existence coexisting and growing. 
without that, you know, the numbers aren't very high at the moment. Happiness stems from helping others. So when we're looking at the whole ecology, you'll see here, you know, there's the psychological references, there's the physical references, there's the seed references. You know, there is other things that we have to keep both internally and externally in harmony. And to have happiness that comes out of our actions in helping others, the point here is still to alleviate the suffering in ourselves and others. And when we actually, on a political level, think, if governments could think, how can I really help, rather than how can I gain something? They're always thinking about, well, we have the Adani mine and we're going to make a lot of jobs and a lot of money and a lot of something. We have this and we're going to gain something. We don't know. More likely, from experience in history, we don't. And it doesn't necessarily add up that, well, it doesn't add up, that we put a lot of money into those resources that are going to be still very short-lived and not more money into the resources that we have in abundance. But helping others is something we must grow and apply this to the marginalized among us. You know, when we think about the marginalized, the poverty-stricken cultures, the issue in those cultures is survival. So they cut the trees for survival. They grow things that are harmful to other human beings for survival. And why are we making them poorer is the question. So how can we help those cultures? How can we help people who are suffering? How can we help people who have impoverished lives. And I tell you, they're our neighbours. They're very close, often. We suffer when we cling. So this is just going through very basic Buddhist tension to our tenets. We suffer when we hang on. We hang on to views. The very nature of happiness is dependent on our capacity to give up our attachments and help others. The same principle must now be elevated and applied to the public policies of all types. So just clinging to our own gains, our own short-lived gains, or our own fame, our own fortune, our own families, is, is a clinging that has a limited capacity to resolve greater issues. The ethical imperative, all beings matter. That all scientists and biologists know that when one creature becomes extinct, there is a very great realm that that creature helps support also dries up and dies. And these, um, you can read in any science issues, but uh, magazines, but uh, very simply, you know, if the human species dies up, then there's a lot of other things that will take over, but may not live very long. Or if, if certain animals die out, there is, uh, you know, they live in certain locations, but they know that as animals die out, that other animals, other animals in that realm that are connected to them also pass away. Even as we let go of the delusion of an individual self that is separate from other people, we must let go of the delusion that humanity is separate from the rest of the biosphere. Our interdependence with nature means that we cannot pursue our own well-being at the cost of the other well-being. When the Earth's ecosystems become sick, so too our bodies and our societies become sick. 
the relationship between the first and the second, I touched on this before, and the capacity to learn, to work within the difficult states. When we go to meditate, that's what we are doing. We are learning to sit with our pain and work with our mental struggles, our thoughts, our emotions. We're working with those causes as well. Not just the outer forms of suffering, but also what is causing. And it is also um, You know, when we look at it, symbolized by the climate disruption and how it came about that we can learn not to identify with it and instead work through the distressing states as fear and despair arise. A lot of people are um, working with climate and ecological groups, but they are working out of great anger and great fear and great stress. And this actually can cause a lot more. To, to work with equanimity is a much more fruitful way. To work with an understanding of those causes. The Buddha never uh, denied that, that suffering would all, all, you know, he never denied the world will always stay as it is. He always put forth that view that things are going to change. That life is going to die. We are going to die. But in that view, we still can, with a mind that is balanced, be with it and come up with um, workable situations. We can be with a body that's aging and still have a mind that's fresh and open and with a good disposition, a good heart. Oh, I saw a, a wonderful little video as at um, yesterday at a interfaith conference for Buddhist women leaders, and I had to speak and offer a paper there. And there was a video at the end of a 93-year-old woman who was speaking about her life when she was born in India, but she was born as as a Jewish lady in India, and she was talking about how everybody in that culture respected each other, and that w her family were made to feel very welcome, and they actually employed people of other faiths. And she spoke with so much joy and so much passion in her 90s. She died shortly after the video was made, her son made it, just within a few weeks, she passed away. But she spoke as if she was still in her 20s full of that passion and joy. I mean, when we get older, we think past, in the, back in the past there, in that way often, but to see that energy that was present. So the mind still can be very fresh, and very open with situations that are not so likable. And um, Opening to the suffering as a vehicle for awakening, this is a carry-on from the last one. You know, when we're talking about the suffering caused by climate disruption, um, you know, there, there are so many, every day on the news we hear of something, and there are so many, you know, reasons we wake up for a few moments because we're in shock. But it's also a very good opportunity that we can find ways to, through an understanding, to do one little thing that may make a difference. And another um, short presentation yesterday was these young is at a young at a school, Islamic school. These young students were making wonderful uh, gifts, you know, to send to Syria. So they themselves were collecting the food, collecting their resources, and collecting whatever was needed to send 200 large parcels to be dropped in Syria, in these camps. So, you know, these, it's just one little gift, and I saw this in, after the bushfires. Little things can be done. The interconnectedness of the inner and outer, the individual and the collective, climate disruption, provides an unprecedented 
opportunity to understand the roots of the problem and which relates to the ways our mind work and again those patterns I talked about becoming embedded in a collective institutional practice and policies. The moment they are collected in institutional political practices and policies, some for the good and some for not so good. But we can be one person in a group that can embed new ways of thinking, new patterns, new behaviours, and it does energise you. It does make you feel you are doing something. This awareness can open the door to new ways of thinking and responding that will eventually produce a different institutional practice and policy. Connections to diversity and justice issues, Dharma principles and narratives must also apply to the issues of diversity and social inclusion and justice. We don't talk about justice so much, but there are times that, you know, we have to judge, we have to make decisions, we have to say this is not right. It's not right. The belief in separateness, etc., that has produced the climate crisis also leads to the social inequity and exclusion. So, you know, sometimes some cultures are so poor because their cultures have been disrupted or the mining has come in or the, the timber, the international timber millers have come in and these countries are, are left barren. It takes a long time for them to actually re-establish a foundation or they may be judged and discriminated on race and colour and other. Buddhism is a social change agent. The principle of Buddhism helps us to engage with life, not remove ourselves from it. The Buddha was actively engaged with his social and cultural context. For the Buddhism to have relevance today, it must help people understand how to engage in today's political and social context. You know, this year was the it's had a gradual decline over the last 10, maybe even 15 years, I think it was. But this year was the lowest number of um, youth who voted. So voting age youth, it was very low. So the youth are so disenchanted with the politics and society as it is, or they're numbed by it, or they don't feel they have any power to give voice to it. So for these young ones sitting in front, <laughs> look clearly at what is happening and vote for policies that can help make a change or make a small group of people who can bring Dharma policy into it, bring Buddhist views to the table. Why not? It's happened in other Buddhist cultures that they have often thought gross national happiness, but that has some flaws, but it has some great merit. Buddhism as a social agent. Buddha was actively engaged with his social and cultural context. And for Buddhism to have relevance today, it must help people understand how to engage. That's what I just talked about in, his, in social and political. Um, aditana, or determination. We are called to develop resolve, determination, and heroic effort now. We must have the courage to realize that we are being called to engage in this issue, and that living the Dharma will see us through the hard times. You know, the living of the Dharma, seeing us through hard times, the practicing of the Dharma, the respecting of our body, the respecting of our environment, the respecting of our water. We take it for granted, but 
it's so important to every, you know, even taking a glass and for a moment before you drink, reflect on that. We are so lucky in this country to have clean water. I have very pure water where I am. A bit too much of an abundance, so I have to be careful not to get too lax with it. And remembering this precious human rebirth is an opportunity. We must always remember that it is a rare, rare and precious thing to be reborn a human. A very rare and very precious thing. We have been given a rare opportunity to act as stewards because humans are not the only source of destruction. There will always be destruction, both natural destruction, animals that eat animals to survive, the greatest destruction of many of the species dying is other animals or predatory animals. But as in a human, this, this word, in this human rebirth, we can be a steward. We have the capacity to develop wisdom and compassion and kindness and appropriate action that wards danger and protects. Love is the greatest motivator. Our deepest and most powerful actions come out of love of this earth and of each other. The more people can connect and feel love for the earth, the greater the likelihood is that their hearts will be moved to help to prevent harm. And then we have children should be therefore a top priority. They need to help people realize that they love what they love about life and what will be lost as climate destruction increases. We keep forgetting it is the children, future generations of children we are trying to protect, the ones coming down the steps now in the future. This is what this point is. And we come to the Sangha or the, the social supports. The Sangha is in the traditional Sangha, the monastic. They live a very a relatively light footprint. I've had to point this out many times in these discussions. When we lived in Korea, we only have a few clothes. We did the work, we grew the vegetables, and the water was taken from the top of the rivers and stored in tanks, and we lived a very light footprint. We didn't go out buying a lot of things. We had no furniture, we had simple bedding, and things were passed on, our clothes were passed on, our bedding was passed on if it wasn't used. And I think in, in monastic societies that is not uh, necessarily um, understood. I didn't hear that come up very much in this weekend because it was, I was the only monastic there. <laughs> but um, I do give credit for, for monasteries. And, and many of them replant trees, they look after their land, they keep their waters clean. And there's a many uh, precepts of the Buddha outlined so as to do this, so as not to bring harm, no, so as not to kill. The very strict practitioners, it's a very, very delicate line to cross if you, you know, even unintentionally take life. And the last is on the Bodhisattva. The figure of the Bodhisattva, which is the one who is training to become a Buddha or training to become enlightened, fully enlightened, is a very, it's a unifying image because the Bodhisattva encompasses so much. Their, their qualities are so refined They've cultivated such as the Buddha over many lifetimes to have not only the endurance of, of a continuing of a path but, and, and developing of the wisdom, but the developing of the many talents and qualities that are needed to help educate, inform, and impress, 
you know, lead others, teach others, inspire others. So a bodhisattva is someone, male, monk, nun, female, it is not distinguished as a, as a, as a, a class of humanity. Is dead or even other in the time of the Buddha he talks about in the Jataka tales, so-called many bodhisattvas there who are, who are doing wonderful action in their species, who is dedicated to cultivate the inner depths and to helping others. It is, an, is a very inspiring figure for our time. So anyone who is doing something... Now, I was very aware of a number of very young Buddhist at these workshops who are very inspiring. One was working in a, and a, a, in a large climate, Australian climate change team. He was very young, but really bringing Dharma to that team because he was questioning, constantly questioning David to take his arguments further. And another young one who was doing the transcribing, he came up to me later because I was also questioning and arguing. I tended to be trying to defend the monastic, you know, because sometimes the lay think, think this is, they're doing all the work in the world. And I was saying, well, it's not really true, you know. In my life, I've had to do a lot of engaging in this way. And, and I do know that is the case when you go into any... Buddhist culture where there is devastation, where climate change has caused landslides or floods or um, fire, you know, the, the monks come out and do a lot. So I question from a very traditional perspective and I think this is something else that is also very important to embody that tradition, to grow that tradition and to act on it through your own understanding and wisdom. That is how people around you will change. How people around you will think a little bit differently. Your children will go, oh, you know, mum's not just the one who's going to the temple to pray to get more. Mum is actually, or dad is actually, concerned on bigger issues. Then they will take interest. Then they will possibly take an interest in Buddhism. Because in all our cultures, we're knowing the youth are walking away. But this is an issue that is about them. It is about us. And it is about the world and the very dramatic changes that are happening at this time. So if you can take one thing out of this talk today, please do so. You don't have to remember it all. If you can connect with one person, with one action, even a kind action, please do so. And if you can support one group who are doing something in some way, that will give empower that group to do more.